Well, how in the world do you follow that? My goodness. Happy Easter, everybody. So glad to see you at Dream City Church. And today I want to start this Easter message by saying a greeting together that's been said for 2,000 years by Christ followers to remind them of the significance of what happened on Easter Sunday. So in just a moment, I'm going to say to you, Christ is risen, and you're going to say back to me, okay, maybe we need a little pep talk here today. It's so weird to me, so strange to me, how Christ followers get so fired up and filled with emotion at a ball game involving complete strangers that you'll never meet than we do over people that we know and claim to love or over events that we claim have changed our lives. Why do we all feel so free to jump to our feet at a ball game and scream and cheer and pump our fist, but then we go home to our homes or, or we go to church, places where we can celebrate way more praiseworthy accomplishments, we kind of sit there and we don't clap, we don't whistle, we don't show any expression at all. Well, today is Easter Sunday. It's the Super Bowl of the Christian faith. So I want us today, at least today, in just a moment, in just a moment, just a moment, I want to prep you for this. At least today, I want you to express the same jubilation and excitement that you feel when your team wins a ball game against all odds. So in just a moment, when I say Christ is risen, I want you to say he is risen indeed. And if you want to clap, cheer, whistle, jump to your feet, pump your fist, everything is legal here today. Now, why in the world are you making such a big deal out of this, Luke? I'll tell you why. Because there was this man named Jesus, and he taught like nobody had ever taught. He lived like nobody had ever lived. He loved like nobody had ever loved. On Friday, his great courage got him arrested. On Friday, his great love led him to a cross where he was crucified. And what looked like a tragic ending to, to, to such a wonderful beginning, it looked like it was all coming to an end. The greatest love story in all of history. On Saturday, there was great silence because the great king was sleeping. And Jesus entered into death, hell, and the grave for you and me. But on Sunday, the stone got rolled away. On Sunday, death lost its sting and the grave was defeated. On Sunday, darkness was derailed and the devil was dis disappointed. On Sunday, faith was vindicated and the prophets were validated. On Sunday, the soldiers were agitated and the disciples got animated. On Sunday, sin lost and shame died and hope soared. On Sunday, you got something beyond yourself to live for, something beyond your life to die for, something beyond this life to hope for. What we are about to proclaim is the greatest victory over the greatest enemy by the noblest hero for the loftiest cause in all of human history. If there's anything in this dark, sorry world we're celebrating, it is this, Christ is risen. Oh, come on, let's celebrate today. Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, 10 more seconds. Let me hear it today. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. That's awesome. Praise God. You can be seated. Now, a skeptic might sit there today and say, so what? What does that actually mean? Well, for those of us who've experienced salvation, it means everything has changed. Everything has changed. Now life, now hardship, pain, even death, everything has changed because of Sunday. So let's take a peek at look what happened and what happened on that first Sunday. Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and he sat on, that, on it. Can you imagine that? 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead and is coming, going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Uh, there you will see him. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. That's interesting. Afraid yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings. That seems a, a bit understated, don't you think? You've just risen from the grave, and all you can say is, greetings? You see, these women are devastated. They love Jesus. And now they come to his tomb, and the stone has been rolled away, and an angel tells them to go back to the disciples and tell them that Jesus is risen. And on their way back on the road, this rabbi whom they loved, this rabbi whom they watched die, this rabbi who they saw buried appears to them, and they wonder, what amazing, profound statement will he make to us? And he says, greetings. Translation, what's up? How y'all doing? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? One day, a pastor was asked to explain the resurrection story to a group of children in a way they can understand it. And so he asked them the question, what were Jesus' first words after he rose from the grave? A little girl raises her hand, and, and the pastor said, yes, you. What, what were the first words? And she said, ta-da! I think it's a better interpretation than what the Bible gives. You know, that's what you say when you've been raised from the dead. But Jesus says, greetings. Listen, on that first Easter, everything changed. But not in the way that most people think that everything changed. Because what comes next is not an explanation from Jesus about how or why. What comes next is an assignment. He said, now you women, there's something for you to do. Now you women, I'm giving you an assignment. You see, from our point of view 2,000 years later, many people think of Easter as this comforting little story, kind of a metaphor that says spring is here, signs of life are all around us, you know, bunnies are hopping all around, let's put our best clothes on and go to church and celebrate because of Easter, everything is going to be okay. In fact, some hard thinkers, some skeptics get pretty skeptical about Christians during Easter time because they view it as a kind of crutch for weak people who just can't deal with the hard reality of death. They view it as a fairy tale day when all the tension got relieved and all the danger got removed and everybody lived happily ever after. But friends, actually, that's exactly what the Easter story is not. When you read the, the gospel accounts of the resurrection, one of the striking things that you will notice is that people got really afraid. In fact, they got more scared after the resurrection than they were before the resurrection. In Matthew's gospel, it says this, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. That's kind of a striking paradox, don't you think? When was the last time you, made a, you met a fearful, joyful person? Right? In Mark's gospel, it says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. John's gospel says it like this. That Sunday evening after the resurrection, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. What's going on here? This is not the Easter story I was taught when I was a kid. There's a lot of fear going on here. Well, let's step into this Easter story from the disciples' perspective for just a moment. Jesus had just been crucified by the powers that be in Jerusalem, the Roman and, and Jewish leaders, because he claimed to be the Messiah, and Rome wanted to crush this movement. And his disciples watched him be crucified to a cross. He died a brutal death, and now they're terrified that they will be next. But now suddenly, Jesus appears to his followers, ta-da, and notice what he doesn't say. He does not say, now all your troubles are over. 
He does not say, now let's all go to heaven and let's celebrate together. He does not say you can all be relieved and thank God the hard part of it is over. What he actually says is, look at me, guys. The cross didn't stick. Look at my life. Their plan to stop my movement didn't work. Look at me, guys. I'm here. My mission continues. As a matter of fact, my plan to love, even to love your enemies and to be willing to suffer, even die for the cause of love, has been validated and vindicated by my Father. Look, guys, the cross didn't work. What he was really saying is this. Now they're really going to be ticked off at you. In fact, Pilate and his chief priests have already plotted ways to crush this news. Now they're really furious, and now they're really desperate. Now I'm going back to my father, Jesus said, but I've asked the Holy Spirit to come to help you, to assist, to assist you and empower you, but I want you to go back now to Jerusalem and tell everyone that you see that the cross failed, that I'm alive, I'm walking around doing just fine, Caesar failed, the chief priest failed, I'm going to my father now, but now they have to deal with you. Jerusalem was a powder keg. Just 36 hours earlier, angry mobs were yelling out, crucify him. To be sent back to that city to tell everyone that the crucifixion failed and Jesus was still alive and on the loose and that you're on his side? That's a very dangerous assignment and they all know it. And they are scared out of their pants. On Sunday, their lives didn't get any safer. On Sunday, their lives got more dangerous. But on Sunday, they find out there's something far more powerful than danger. Because the Bible says they were filled, they were afraid yet filled with joy. So look this way. What does Easter Sunday really mean? What does Sunday mean? Sunday is not this comforting little metaphor. It's not this modern day image of spring being here and flowers sprouting up. It's not this annual reassurance in the face of death. Sunday is simply all about Jesus. Sunday means that everything Jesus ever said about God, about life, about death, about love, about suffering, about sacrifice, about surrendering your life to God, it's all true. It's all true. Sunday means that God, who created everything in the very beginning, back in Genesis, and yet mankind, we went our own way, we went astray. Now God is recreating everything. That's what Easter is. Sunday means that God is back on it. Sunday means that God is remaking everything, beginning with those disciples and continuing with you and with me. I want to share with you today four powerful things that happen to these disciples because of Sunday, four powerful things that can happen in your life if you would like it to. Four things that happens because of this rebirth, this restart of humanity. Here's the first thing. Because of Sunday and this new creation, they received a brand new identity, an identity beyond just their sinful, sorry selves. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 20 and verse 17. He says, go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. This is so cool. Up until now in the gospel of John, Jesus calls them his disciples or his friends or his servants. But now for the first time ever, he calls them my brothers, my sisters. And this is so poignant because remember, the last time they were with him, they deserted Jesus. So you can imagine how they felt about themselves. They viewed themselves as failures. They viewed themselves as losers, as cowards. But Jesus said, I don't see you guys that way at all. I see you as my brothers, as my sisters. Something happened on Easter Sunday. Something happened on Friday, Saturday, Sunday that provided for them a brand new identity. And this identity was not based on their performance because their performance really stunk. They betrayed him. They deserted him. They were failures. They were losers. This new identity was based on a gift from God called grace. God gave them a new identity. A second thing, 
Because of Sunday, they also received a new intimacy. Notice in that same verse, up until now, Jesus called his father God. He said God, he called God my father. But now he deliberately says in verse 17, I am returning to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. He had never said that before. In other words, something happened on Easter. Something happened in this Friday, Saturday, Sunday story. A new intimacy with God among people is now possible. She said, now you can have a relationship with God that I had with my father while I was on earth. Somehow the resurrection opened a door to a whole new intimacy with God. Third, because of Sunday, this Friday, Saturday, Sunday story, they also received a new inclusivity. This is a really cool part about the new creation. In all four Gospels, the privilege of being the key witnesses who testify to the truth and the accuracy of the resurrection is given to women. Let's hear it for the women. This may not seem like a big deal in our culture, but it was huge back in Jesus' day. The ancient world, especially ancient Israel, women were not allowed to even serve as witnesses in a legal dispute. Their testimony was not valued. You could kill somebody, a hundred women could see it, but if no man saw it, then those hundred women's testimony would not be taken into court. And we see this prejudice against the women in Luke's account of the resurrection story. This is what it says. When they, that's the women, came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11. Now the 11, that's the disciples minus Judas. This is the all men's club, right? But they, the men, did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense to them. So I want you to get the picture here. These women come back to the disciples, the all men's club, and they say, Jesus is alive. We met him on the road. We heard his voice. We saw him there. And the disciples do not believe the women. They say, you are talking nonsense, ladies. You know how ladies can be. I can hear them right now. All those male chauvinistic things that people say. Can you uh, imagine the frustration of the women in that moment? They're just trying to help the disciples. Who, by the way, the disciples, when Jesus was taken to Golgotha to be crucified, the men ran away in fear, and the women followed Jesus all the way to the cross, right? So they were the brave ones, and now they are saying to the disciples, you know, he appeared to us, and by the way, we followed Jesus all the way to the cross, you did not, and we're just trying to help you, and you accuse us of talking nonsense. Well, then Jesus appeared to the disciples, ta-da! And the record was set straight. Can you imagine being there the next time the women and the disciples got together and they do that formal greeting where the men say, you know, uh, Christ is risen. And the women say, we told you so. (laughs) They changed the whole thing, you know. (laughs) Sunday changed everything, friends. Listen carefully. It gave people a new identity, and some of you need your real identity. You need the real you, the one God made you to be. You need that identity clarified today. Some of you, he he also gave people a new intimacy with God, a new inclusivity. It gave people something to live for in this life, something to die for in this life, but it didn't make their life safer. In fact, Sunday validated what Jesus said a long, long time ago. He said in Matthew 16, 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after me. What that means is there there were some things that those early disciples had to put on the cross. What it meant was the only way to get to this new birth, this new resurrection, is go back to Friday. You can't get to Sunday until you go to Friday. And there are some things we got to nail to the cross with Jesus Christ before we feel this new resurrection inside of us. And it can begin today. And fourth and last, because of Sunday, they received a brand new language. I love this. This is so interesting. 
his followers, followers began to speak in a kind of Friday, Saturday, Sunday language. They begin to say odd things like this. Paul says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, Paul was saying, look, I have a brand new story. I'm not the person I used to be. There's a part in me that's still selfish and sinful and so messed up. There's this part in me that keeps trying to screw up my life and makes me feel so far from God. And they would call this the old man, the old nature the old self, the old person, and they said, that's the part in me that must be crucified to the cross. That's the part that needs to die. You see, on Friday, the idea was not so much Jesus died so I don't have to. It was he died so that part of me could die with him on the cross. He was crucified so I could be crucified with him. This part of me that's sinful and dark, those habits and those hang-ups that are so harmful, they hurt my life. I can't stop them on my own, but I can surrender them to God. I can put them on the cross. And through his power, his resurrection power, his rebirth, his new story, he can tell a new story through my life. They would say things like this in Romans 6. Paul says, we know that our old sinful selves was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin like we used to be. That's the old man. That's the old self. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. They said, I am not the person I once was. I'm becoming a brand new person. The old is gone. The new has come. And the clock is ticking. It won't be long till the old self is completely moved moved out because I'm a different person. Paul talks about this rebirth, and one of the words he uses is a Greek word called metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis, which means to morph or to change. I was thinking about this when I was a teenager. There was a popular show in the 1990s called The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Anybody heard of that, of that, of that show? It's a cheesy show, originally done in Japan, then dubbed into English. But it was these young kids who would find themselves in these massive crises, but their rallying cry was, it's morphin' time. And when they said those words, it's morphin' time, they would receive unbelievable power to change and do supernatural acts that save the day. Here's the deal. What Sunday meant was, it's morphin' time. It's morphin' time. I've been dying a little on the inside, and so have you. Dying on the inside because I do things I just don't want to do. Dying on the inside because I'm not the man I, I long to be, but now it's morphing time. It does not mean that I'm a perfect man because the old self tries to keep coming up and rising up, but the clock is ticking on that old self because I'm being remade by this new story. So when I sin, I remember the penalty of my sin already got paid for on Good Friday. Come on, somebody. That death already got died. That debt got paid. So I confess my sin, and I ask God, will you help me overcome this pattern, this habit, this old part of my life, and I make amends with those I hurt, but then I let it go. I refuse to allow my, my, my past sins and my past mistakes to, to identify my life anymore. I'm changing, I'm different, I'm not the man I used to be a year ago. God's presence is welling up inside of me. The old is gone, the new has come. That's my story. That's my story. I told the nine o'clock service, I was feeling so bad a couple weeks ago about something I had done. I don't know if you've ever had these feelings, but you kind of you think back about something you said or you, or you did, and you're like, oh, oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I treated that person that way. I'm sitting in my car just thinking about this, having a moment like, I, I, really, Luke, again? You said these things again? You said you never would do it again. You promised God you'd never say it again, but you did. Anybody else ever had those conversations with God? Then this thought overcame me. 
in this moment right now, it's still okay to believe that God loves me. Even in this moment right now, it's still okay to believe that God loves me. And I, I just can't tell you how that moment filled the car with joy and life and love. I just kept saying to myself over and over again, no matter what I've done, I am loved by God. And I'm not the same person I used to be. I am changing. I am growing. Through Jesus Christ, I have a story. And it's not my story. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday story, which means my old life has been crucified on the cross with Jesus, and he has raised me up to new life. And I'm changing. I'm morphing. I'm growing. I'm not the person I used to be. So I just want to ask you today as we... Prepare to close this service. Do you have a story? What is your story? Is God remaking your life? Have you ever come to a place in your life where you threw your hands up and finally just said, God, I want a, a Friday, Saturday, st Sunday story for my life. I want this rebirth thing to happen in my life. Friends, Jesus is alive, and he is still forgiving sin, and he's still offering people like you and I a new identity, and he's still offering new levels of intimacy with God, and he's still giving people the power to change, even though sometimes they feel like they're unable to change. He's still offering the power to change, just like he did for a man named Louis Zapparini. Louis Zapparini, there's a book about him called Unbroken, also a movie. Louis was an Olympic runner back in the 1930s. He was a phenomenal athlete. He had this whole amazing life in front of him. He winds up serving in World War II as a pilot, and he actually gets shot down in the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, rather. And he is surviving on a life raft for 47 days. Nobody had ever lived that long on the ocean before on a raft. It was a record. And during that time, people didn't know how he stayed alive. He kept saying to God every day, if you keep me alive, if you let me live, I will commit my life to you. Well, Lewis ends up getting rescued by a battleship, but it turns out to be an enemy ship. And he goes from this life raft into a POW camp where he suffers unspeakable torment and starvation and brutality and just hatred. And just when it appears like that Lewis is about to perish and lose his life, he gets rescued. He gets brought back to the United States of America and there's a big sigh of relief when you're reading the book, like, man, finally this guy's misery is over, but it just gets worse. When he gets back to the United States because of all the, the hatred and the bitterness that had welled up in his heart, and because he saw so many of his friends die in that POW camp, he had such stiffness and, and hatred in his heart, and he didn't know how to deal with it. It about drove him mad. And so he started drinking alcohol. And here's the thing about alcohol. We're free to drink alcohol, but many people are no longer free not to drink alcohol because they're slaves. They can't put it down. He becomes a slave to alcohol. He becomes an alcoholic. And now he's about to lose his marriage and family because of alcoholism. Meanwhile, he has this fabulous wife. And she is so desperate to see him, his life change that she takes him to a Billy Graham crusade. This is back in the 1940s. And Billy Graham tells a story about a savior who dies on a cross for his sins and it raised him again on Sunday. And then Billy asks, is there anyone here who wants to have a new story? Is there anyone here who wants to have a Friday, Saturday, Sunday story and be reborn today and have God rewrite your whole life? And Zim, Lewis, he's so stiff-necked and so rebellious and so hardened that he just gets up and walks out. He says, I don't, want to, I don't want to hear it. But his wife is relentless and she's desperate. Their marriage is about to end. And she convinces him to go back a second time. And he said, I'll go back with you a second night, but when he gets the invitation time, I'm walking out. I'm not listening to that. So they go back a second night. Toward the end, Billy Graham looks out on that vast crowd and says, is there anyone here who needs God to write a new story through your life? A Friday, Saturday, Sunday story. 
And Lewis is so stiff necked, he decides to get up and walk out, but he, he tries to get up, but his, his legs won't work. He's literally paralyzed. He, he can't get up. And in that moment, he began to think back on that life raft. How many times he told God, if you save me, I will give my life to you. And in that moment, his spirit just kind of crumbled. And all the sniff stiffness left his spine. And he opened his heart up to Jesus Christ. And in that moment, Christ came in, made him born again. It was a new birth spiritually. He went on to live this fascinating life. I would encourage you to read the book. He died just a few years ago after living this amazing life. But I want to ask you, how about you today? Have you been far away from God for a long, long time? You need to know that Jesus is accepting people like you and like Lewis right now. Would you open your heart to Almighty God today? Listen, you are an eternal being and you will never cease to exist. Not even when you close your eyes on this earth, your eyes will open somewhere. You will never die, your spirit. He's accepting new people right now. Would you open your heart to God? Maybe you've been away from God for a long, long time. Maybe you've done things you're not proud of. So have I. Maybe you've said things that have brought shame upon you. So have I. But in Jesus Christ, you have a heavenly father who says to you right now, please just come home. Just come as you are. I have a brand new story that I want to write in and through your life. And it's not an ordinary story. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday story. Would you let me, through my power, write a new story through your life? Amen. Would you all stand to your feet for a closing prayer? And would you bow your heads and please close your eyes for just a moment? Would you please just close yourself away right now with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God? I know there are people in this place today who you've been living your life and you've been on a certain trajectory. And you've been wondering in your heart if there really is more to this life more than eating and sleeping and getting up and going to work and coming home at night and living for the weekends. And you've been saying, surely there must be more to life than just that, and there is. There's a God who loves you. There's a God who went to a cross and died for you. And he says to you today, if you would let me shoulder all your sins, all your wrongdoings, I will take those upon my shoulders today. And in replacement for those sins, I will place my presence in you. And I will begin to write a new story with what's left of the rest of your life. Would you allow him to do that work in you today? Would you allow him to give you a Friday, Saturday, Sunday story? All across this place while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you'll say, Pastor Luke, today, the Lord has touched my heart. I know there must be more to life than that which I'm experiencing. Because life seems pretty shallow at this point, And it will always be shallow. Until you meet the one who made you. The one who loves you. The one who died for you. How do you meet him? The Bible says we must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus, that he died on the cross and he rose again for our sins. And if you can believe that today and if you can confess your sins and say, Lord, I, I want to nail my old life to the cross with you. And Lord, I'll, I'll need your strength and your power and your grace to help me live a new life. But I'm asking you today, God, to write a brand new story in my life. If you can say those words today, you can be saved. You can be redeemed. You can lay your head on the pillow tonight and know that if anything happens to you, you'd be ready to meet God. Man, what a way to live. 
What a way to live. So right now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm going to ask in just a moment for those of you who feel far from God right now, and you want today, Easter Sunday, 2022, to be your day where a new story begins in your life. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand up and down just so I know who I'm praying with. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know who I'm praying with. I'm going to count to number three. When I say three, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand straight up and down. We're going to pray, and God is going to answer that prayer. He's going to come into your life today, fill your life with his presence, and start a new story. So I'm going to count to three. Get ready. One, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Two, Christians are praying all throughout this place. When I say three, if there's any doubt at all in your heart about whether or not you know the Lord, but you want to know him today, all across this place, when I say three, raise it or high. Get ready. Three, put it up all this place. I want to know God today. I want to know God today. I want a new story. I want the old to go and the new to come. Thank God. Thank God. There's so many. You can put your hands down. There's hundreds of hands that have gone up today. Thank God. Thank God. The Bible says we must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. So right now, all across this place, if you prayed that prayer, or rather, if you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need God, right now, I'm going to ask you to repeat these words after me. I'm going to lead you in prayer. God's going to come into your life and save you in this moment, make you born again, and give you a new story. So all across this place, say these words after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I need you in my life. There's something missing in my life. I tried to fill it with many things. Nothing seems to work. But I believe that place in my life was made for you. I open my heart to you today. I put all my confidence in you and the work that your son Jesus did on the cross. I surrender my life to you. Today I declare that my old life, the old me, gets crucified on the cross with Jesus. And I choose to follow you. You are my savior. You are my leader. You're the Lord of my life. And I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for making me born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God today for what he's done.